NASCAR responds to the 2311 FRM lawsuit in court on Wednesday. Ty Gibbs is going to be an Xfinity Series team owner in 2025. And Nitro Cross has halted their season to the surprise of, well, no one. Welcome back to Break Hard, I'm Matt. So apparently the soup market in America is doing pretty well. I don't drink soup, I don't eat soup, however you consume soup, I don't do it. I think it's weird, I don't like it. It comes down to a texture thing, we're being completely honest. Uh, but I know it's very popular out there. I know you put it into a thermos, I know you eat it with you know grilled cheese and whatever else when you're feeling sick. Apparently business is doing really well though because on Thursday, Joe Gibbs Racing and Campbell Soup announced a partnership for 2025. It's actually a part of a bigger deal with the Harris Blitzer Sports Entertainment Group, which involves the Washington Commanders, as well as some other properties um, in there. So we should be getting some Campbell Soup paint schemes next year, which I think would be really cool because it's different. We haven't seen it. Um, and I ha they have a m bunch of different brands that they could work into it as well. So yeah, give me all of those. Let's see what they can come up with. And heck, maybe I'll even try some soup. But getting into some of the bigger stories for Thursday. On Wednesday night, NASCAR finally responded to the 2311 FRM uh, lawsuit. Not publicly. They did not issue a statement. They're not going to issue a statement. They don't comment on ongoing litigation. But NASCAR has asked for the expedited discovery requested by 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports to be denied. In their 22-page document that was submitted to the course on Wednesday, NASCAR had some pretty strong takes. And they are preparing for the 2025 season with only 32 charter cars. Now, you're sitting there doing the math, and you're like, Matt, there's 36 charter cars, 32. Does that mean that those four aren't going to be included? Yeah, it does, actually. So what happens to those four charters? NASCAR does retain the right to pull those charters back and take them back at the end of 2024. However, with the ongoing litigation, not necessarily sure how that's going to affect it. So for right now, they're just planning on only having 32 chartered cars next season, while those four kind of sit in purgatory. What happens to the other two charters that they are buying from Stuart Haas Racing? Well, Stuart Haas Racing signed the new charter agreement for those charters, um, but those charters are kind of hung up in escrow. They have to be approved by NASCAR. NASCAR is not going to approve them because, well, those cars haven't accepted, those teams rather haven't accepted the charter agreements. So now we kind of just have six charters that are going to be sitting in purgatory unless, of course, SHR, um, you know, wants to renege on those deals if there is an out for them in the contracts. Not entirely sure that's for a future discussion. Not even sure if there's a market uh, for those charters right now. There could be. I think maybe one Ford team is looking to add a third car. Maybe we'll get an announcement on that at some point and not a paint scheme. Either way, NASCAR did come out swinging in their um, submission to the court saying, quote, Plaintiffs have filed a meritless suit against NASCAR alleging baseless antitrust claims in order to obtain commercial agreements they previously rejected and to extort more favorable contract terms. So what NASCAR is saying right there is, hey, listen, you want the charter, you want the benefits that come along with the charter, you like that, but you're not willing to agree to the charter agreement like the 13 of the 15 other teams did. So essentially, they're saying you can't have your cake and eat it too, is what NASCAR is saying here in layman terms. I'm going to try to break it down uh, for people, which... They're not wrong, but of course, it's up to a judge whether he's going to uh, grant that injunction or not, which would allow those teams to race under the charter agreement in 2025 and still get the payouts that come along with that charter agreement. NASCAR would very much like the judge to not grant that, but we're going to have to wait and see. It also goes on to say, quote, the deadline for plaintiffs to sign 2025 charter agreements expired weeks ago, and NASCAR has taken steps consistent with its contractual obligations to other charter teams to plan for a season with only 32 charters. Plaintiffs do not need these charter agreements to race and indeed have stated publicly that they will be racing in NASCAR regardless. That last line right there, I think, is something that 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports are going to wish they maybe hadn't mentioned um, when they filed this lawsuit because Curtis Polk was adamant that they would be racing in 2025 regardless if they got that injunction to keep their charters, uh, to, well, to keep racing under the charter agreement next season, or they would race as open cars. It did not matter to them. They would be on the racetrack. So what NASCAR is saying here is like, hey, They've already said they don't need these charters. They said they're willing to race as open cars anyways. Yeah, the charter agreement does come with bigger payouts, does come with more money. That is better for business. But if NASCAR's arguing here, just I'll be NASCAR for a second, they're going to say, well, 
yeah, you're right, it does give more money, but they've already said they don't need that essentially because they're willing to race as open cars, meaning they don't need this injunction. We'll have to go ahead and settle this lawsuit. So I think that might work against them, but again, it all comes down to how a judge rules on this injunction. NASCAR also says, quote, NASCAR is working on reallocating funds that plaintiffs would have received to increase prize money and other special awards for the 2025 season for the benefit of teams that timely executed 2025 charters, as well as open teams who can compete to win increased prize money. So they're taking the money from those four chartered cars that they're planning on not having next year, NASCAR that is, and they'll be reallocating some of those funds to the 32 charter cars, as well as what I assume is now eight open spots for 2025. And I think that part probably needs to be talked about more because there were only four open spots, you know, prior to, to 2025. And assuming they don't get an injunction, that means there's going to be eight open spots next year, which means we could see somebody like Aspire in our fourth car or, you know, a third car in some team situations and try to enter the race and make the race and be guaranteed to pay out. Obviously, it's not going to be as big as the charters, but it's still going to be um, more than it was in 2024. There is one line, though, that caught my attention as well as Kelly Crandall over at Racer.com. She did a great write-up on it. Go over and check that out. Quote, plaintiff's overreaching requests belied their true aim to use the antitrust discovery process as a weapon. So NASCAR saying that the only reason they want the, or the discovery period is to be able to use that against NASCAR by opening up their books, in which case NASCAR did say if the courts rule in favor of expedited discovery, NASCAR has asked that the discovery be reciprocal, meaning that 2311 Racing and Front Row motorsports now have to open up their books now have to open up their financials for nascar to be able to look at in that situation and they probably don't want to do that the same way nascar doesn't want to do it on their end um either way it is going to be a heck of a battle between these two and it does not seem like they're willing to settle at the moment and nascar are apparently seems very much content going into 2025 with this still going on and with only 32 charter teams uh we're gonna have to wait and see how all this plays out on Wednesday, we got the news that Joe Gibbs Racing finally announced that Taylor Gray would be going uh, full time to the Xfinity Series next season with them driving the number 54 car uh, full time. Obviously, the 54 was Ty Gibbs's number before that was Kyle Busch's number. But Ty Gibbs kind of, you know, won a championship with it and Xfinity took it up to the Cup Series. And now it'll be back in the Xfinity series and Ty Gibbs will be listed as the owner. So after that announcement, Ty Gibbs posted to, uh, you know, he posted an Instagram story and insinuated that he would be the owner. And everyone's like, is Ty Gibbs an owner now? Like what is happening here? Uh, so Toby Christie and some others reached out to Joe Gibbs Racing, who confirmed that Ty Gibbs will be listed as the owner of that 54 car in 2025, which I think is actually a good thing. Now it's not out of the ordinary. We have certainly seen organizations have different people listed as their owners before Junior Motorsports as Kelly. Dale Earnhardt, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Rick Hendrick at times, uh, Jimmy Johnson when he was in the 48 car at Hendrick Motorsports, Jeff Gordon was listed as the owner, Matt Kenseth in the 17 at Roush, uh, uh, Mark Martin was listed as the owner. So it's not crazy, but I think it's a good thing overall. Uh, obviously, Joe Gibbs has had some unfortunate, you know, um, the unfortunate passing of both of his sons in J.D. Gibbs and Coy Gibbs in recent years, and that kind of really messed up the succession plan for the family business. Uh, Ty Gibbs' mom, Heather Gibbs, has taken on a bigger role over in the organization. Uh, obviously, they did a deal last year with the Harris Blitzer Sports Entertainment Group, which will you know help them uh, kind of set the foundation for the future. And Ty Gibbs getting involved on the team owner side at only 22 years old is a good thing for him to continue to build up as he you know goes through his racing career and then will ultimately, I assume, transition to a, uh, a managerial role within the family business, assuming that they still have it when that time comes. But there's nothing bad about this, right? A driver reinvesting into the sport, a driver that wants to, you know, learn more about the business side of it is certainly not a bad thing at all. Is, you know, Ty gives more moody than Roman Roy at times. Yeah, absolutely. We get it. But he has certainly calmed down uh, as he, you know, gets a little bit older and he's not going to be the Kendall Roy and kind of go, you know, blazing into this with absolutely zero clue on what he's doing and just get owned. And then Tom becomes the CEO. That's not going to happen in this situation. I think it's a really good thing going forward. Um, obviously, him being listed as the team owner, his dad w oversaw the Joe Gibbs Racing Xfinity Series, um, you know, organ or operation. That's why they run the JGR. The different JGR logo on the Xfinity cars is because that came from the Joe Gibbs Racing Supercross days when Coy Gibbs oversaw that program. Uh, so it's a bit of an homage to him. And now Ty, you know, 
you know, owning a cup car, um, I think is another great way to pay tribute to his dad, but also learn the family business at the same time. So overall, I think this is a really good move, really smart move by both Ty and Joe Gibbs Racing, and uh, look forward to kind of see how all of that progresses over the upcoming years. Nitro Cross has halted its current season to the surprise of well, everyone, because I'm not sure many people even knew it existed or was even operating at this point. So according to Racer.com, there were some uh, managerial changes within Thrill One, which is the parent company of Nitro Cross, Nitro Circus, and that has resulted in the season being halted. What maybe it's just as bigger factors than that. Like having a spec EV series is not appealing to M American motorsport fans. Putting your races exclusively on um, the video platform Rumble, again, not very good for business. And then having a really fractured calendar with uh, changing you know, lineup of drivers just never really seemed to take off. Yeah, having spec racing is certainly one thing. Having it be spec EV, that's another thing. People really aren't into large RC cars essentially going around a racetrack. It's just not very appealing for a lot of uh, a lot of motorsport fans, especially in America. Then you put it onto a video platform in Rumble, which nobody checks on a daily basis outside of the people that are still, you know, searching for the black hole that swallowed up MH370 or trying to prove that the Titanic was a ghost ship and didn't actually run into an iceberg. Most people aren't visiting Rumble for for, you know, motorsport content. So Combine those two factors and you're like, well, this is not really, you know, conducive to, you know, creating a popular racing series. Now, Thrill One is Dana White's company. I know people are like, Dana White, you know, he built the UFC up. It's super successful. And you're right. That's it, though. I was trying to think of what else he, you know, made successful and I can't come to any conclusion. Don't get me wrong. UFC is an absolute behemoth, but I don't think Dana White understands motorsports and like he wants to take nitro cross to the las vegas strip and build like this you know battle dome battle field for the racetrack there and everything and it's like that's really not going to work everything about him is about like combat fighting and you know you know collision which uh, yeah you're right like nitro cross is beating and banging type of racing but it never really appealed to people. Um, it's not that ac it's accessible, but you got to know where to look for it. And if nobody's advertising, it doesn't really work. At least when it was on Peacock, it had the infrastructure of NBC, all their social accounts to promote it. Now it's basically reliant on Travis Estrana and Nitro Cross and the people that are competing to promote it. And it never really seemed to take off in that situation. So this is the same company, Throw One, that wants to do a deal with NASCAR to race the NASCAR EV prototype, which we saw uh, you know, unveiled back at the Chicago Street Course 4th of July weekend. And if you're NASCAR, I'm sure they're probably a little weary of what's going on here uh, with it. Now we'll see what happens to Nitro Cross. So they have the SRX fate where somebody's going to come in and try to buy it, or does it just stay dormant forever? It's sitting around in purgatory like it's a charter from 2311 Racing or FRM. Ah, I guess we're going to actually have to literally wait and see on this one. But let me know in the comments what you think about NASCAR's response. Ty Gibbs being a team owner, Nitro Cross being halted and probably maybe not coming back. Sucks for Dodge. They just got into a dry Reinbold and like one race into their contract series is gone. <laughs> like That's just Dodge and American Motorsports for the most part. Um, yeah, let me know in the comments what you think. Like and subscribe uh, to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at BreakHardBlog.